And the sermon title for today is the Day of Authority. Day of Authority. And a word from our founding pastor. Today, they call it the Day of Authority, which is the second day. Yesterday's entry was the first day of the week. Today is the second day. And on the second day, as we follow in Jesus' footsteps, we learn about Jesus' heart, what he does today, and what words he expects from each of us, for ourselves, for our ancestors, for all of mankind, especially for our believing families. So we need to give an appropriate answer and in our hearts of faith before entering the church. Earlier, yesterday, to fulfill the Bible according to the prophet's prophecy, it said in Zechariah 9.9 that a humble king would enter riding on a donkey. Although it was less than 600 years ago, the prophet Zechariah prophesied it more than 500 years ago. In every country, how dignified is that status of a general with a large war horse, a white horse, a saddle, or a rank insignia in full regalia? And the flash of countless spears and swords the sound of military boots, and tens of thousands of soldiers. And then they would have a military band stand in front of them. The majesty is impressive. And they would enter the military parade as a general. But Jesus is riding on a colt, a baby donkey. It's tottering. The adult Jesus is riding on it, so would the donkey even walk properly? Everyone who saw him probably thought he was crazy. But you cannot not do that because the prophet foretold this. So the one riding the donkey is the king of kings, the humble Messiah, the Savior. Up until this day, while Jesus was teaching the word, people said, don't say you're the Messiah. They shushed him. However, it was revealed while he was entering Jerusalem while riding a donkey. I am the King, I am the Messiah, I am the Savior, I am the Son of God. It was revealed. So all these kids and adults, how uncomfortable it must have been to ride a donkey without a saddle. He rode this way and that way. The children, the adults and the women they spread their cloaks on the street. They held up palm branches and shouted, Hosanna to the son of David, O king. And it must have been so shocking that in Matthew 21, said that Jerusalem was in turmoil, as if there had been a riot. And many people asked, who is that? He is from Nazareth, and his name is Jesus Christ. So I said this yesterday, but the religious leaders of the time, they had a fierce look in their eyes, didn't they? Hey, Jesus, why are you being honored by these rude and ignorant people? Don't let anyone say Hosanna to the son of David. And then Jesus said, if these people stop speaking, the stones in the street will cry out. So after he entered Jerusalem, he went inside the temple. And when he entered the temple, it was a robber's hangout, a den of robbers. Aren't robbers worse than thieves? If a thief gets one year in prison, a robber gets seven years. And this is what God said. He said, that they made the temple that way, not as a den of thieves, but a den of robbers. 
At that time, the Pharisees and the priests loved money. So they should have left some profit, but they kept a lot. They exploited it, and they gave it all to the religious leaders behind the scenes. And Jesus knew this. And when he kicks the table of money that they made from money changing, the money flew off the table. And it was to the point that his upper legs were broken. And when you look at the Bible, ask, where are you going? The church is a house of prayer. It's in today's text. They couldn't even walk through. If you've come to church, you should pray to God. And this is prophesied by the prophet Isaiah and the prophet Jeremiah. It's also in Isaiah 56, etc. This church is a house of prayer before God. If you were to see him with your two eyes, quoting those words, while making a whip and beating them, would you see Jesus as merciful and loving? They saw him as a leader of a gang. He just kicked and grabbed with his hands and threw. And there are differences between the records of Matthew and Mark. In Matthew, we see after he entered Jerusalem on donkey, he went to the temple and took a quick look. He knows everything. For example, if you look at the pulpit, you know who gave offering and who bought it. He is God after all. He is God. And also in John chapter 2, verse 24 to 25, isn't this word that I always enjoy using? He knows everything without needing people's testimony without receiving reports, without saying anything. He slept at Bethany, but Mark has it that he immediately went and beat them all up. So, Jesus, did Jesus go to temple all day to him? And listen to what he said. There was no place to pray. If you pray, you'll be treated as an idiot. That's how they would treat you. And Jesus was, saw that, and he cleansed the temple. Today is the day that Jesus shows the power and authority of Jesus. This is the day we came to this earth and he spoke and acted as the last day of authority, the last day of authority today. And there is the cursing of the fig tree. After sleeping and coming out of Bethany, and because it was a poor household in Bethany, they couldn't even give him breakfast. But was he alone? He had these immature 12 disciples who constantly hung around him. And there's 13 of them, including Jesus. But the, could this household entertain these people? Let's say you have to serve one bowl of water, but now you have to serve 13 bowls of water. And you can't even serve half the amount. So they weren't able to eat breakfast or be treated well. And they're on the way to temple, and there's a fig tree. And to say that it was not time for figs means they weren't ripe. There must be at least some green fruit. So even if you eat green figs, you won't get sick or it, it's not bitter. But when Jesus went there, only the leaves were overgrown. And now look at Jesus, the merciful and loving God. He says, you will never bear fruit from now on. He said it, and he left, and all the disciples heard it. So after going to temple, breaking everything down, and testifying the great word of God, and asking and answering questions to many people, suffering for a day, and in his tired state, 
He noticed that the fig tree that had been fresh in the morning withered by evening with Jesus' word. Teacher, the fig tree withered and died. So with one word from Jesus, it gave the right to survive, to live, or die. This is the word of power. So there's a difference between what the pastors at the time said and what Jesus said. Who is this? This is very different from the words we hear from religious leaders and the pastors. There's power in his words. This is recorded in Matthew chapter 7, verses 28 and 29, and also in Matthew chapter 13, 54. And it's also recorded in Acts 1. We can't read it now due to time constraints. Dear saints, each country has a national flower. Korea's national flower is the Rose of Sharon. China's national flower is the Plum Blossom. Japan's is the Cherry Blossom. And Israel's national flower is the fig tree blossoms. The fig tree blossom is the national flower of Israel. So in Jeremiah chapter 24, verses 1 through 6, we see that it's accurately written that the nation of Israel is a fig, compared to as a fig. Is an evil fig or a good fig? amazing and look at John the Baptist cry at the time he said to the religious leaders the priests the Pharisees and scribes hey you brood of vipers you serpents do you know how to avoid the judgment of hell if you don't bear the fruit worthy of repentance, the axe is already laid at the root of the tree, and every tree that does not bear fruit is cut and thrown down. In this parable in Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 9, if we look there, there's a man who planted figs in a vineyard, right? The owner came every year and it didn't bear fruit in the third year, and still nothing. He called the vineyard keeper and said, Hey, cut down this fig tree. It's wasting land. Isn't Jesus the vineyard keeper? The owner is God. And Jesus the vineyard keeper said, Father, Master, please be patient for one year. I will dig a ditch, fertilize it, take care of it, and plant it for a year. And if it still does not bear fruit, then I will cut it down. And didn't they receive a one-year suspended sentence? But still no fruit. In, in fact, Jesus cursed the figs. But when we look at our lives of faith, we still say to this day, Lord, I believe. And we, we're proud to say that we all received grace and everyone's proud of their faith. But are there any fruits of faith? Are there any fruits of grace? Is there any fruit of repentance? If we look at Galatians 5.22 and the following, is there the fruit of love? Do you have the fruit of the Holy Spirit? You're the temple that serves God. You're your church, your temple. 2,000 years ago, he entered the temple in Jerusalem, which took 46 years to build. But today, he's the Lord in the hearts of everyone, including me. And when he comes in and inspects and internally investigates what we've done in the past and what we believe in today, and what's happening in our lives today says in James 1.17 that there are many kinds of righteous fruit that come from above but if we don't believe 
what would happen if we don't bear any of that fruit? Reading the Bible is also fruit. God also sees prayer as fruit. He looks at the fruits of temple construction, district offerings, and offerings from women's ministry, men's ministry, college students, and young adults. If the Lord came into my heart and said, Hey, how many years have you been pretending to believe in me? When you were in elementary school, middle school, high school, and college, and now you're over 40, how many decades did you believe? But when I entered your temple, I found no fruit at all. There's no fruit of prayer, and there's no fruit from reading the Bible. And when a pastor testifies the word, an evangelist, or someone else testifies, there's no fruit of hearing. So in Revelation 1.3, says, Blessed are those who read the Bible, those who hear it, and those who keep what's written in it. And when we look at the words of Psalm 1.1 and the following, it says, a blessed person does not stand in the path of sinners. He does not fall for the tricks of the wicked. And if someone's not blessed, everything does is in vain. He's deceived and he commits sins. I called your heart a temple. And so today, this Monday, the second day, 2,000 years ago, I entered the temple of the Israelites. But isn't that our temples now? If we look at 1 Corinthians 6.19 and also in 3.16, 1 Corinthians 3.16, they call themselves a temple and God went there, but why is there nothing there? There's no fruit of zeal in coming to church. There's no fruit of longing. Everything is just in moderation. How can you say you're my son? Are you truly the son? He's asking, are you the son of the world? Everyone, please don't take this lightly or as a laughing matter. He's entering the temple today and he's entering the temples of our hearts and examining all the members of Pyongyang Jia Church. He said, my house is a house of prayer. So when Jesus comes and he visits a praying saint, shouldn't he examine our hearts and go away happy? This is the problem. Even the roots withered and died. Teacher, it's dried up to the roots. Even the right to survive was taken away. So when Jesus saw the fruitlessness of Israel, he cried and wept. And as he struck the ground, he asked, God, what will happen to the Israelites in the future? said they would crush the children, right? In 70 AD, the Roman general Titus came and killed 1.1 million people. At that time, the historian Josephus said, the blood, listen carefully, the blood flowed up to the horse's bridle. A bridle was put on the horse's muzzle, so that many people died that the blood of the 1.1 million people rose from the ground to the horse's bridle. That's how many died. This is the last verse of Revelation 14. It's 1.1 million people. And they boiled their babies and ate them, grilled them. And this is in, during the Old Testament times, during the times of the Old Testament. In the past, through Moses, God told people that if they lead a fruitless life of faith, the nation will become poor and suffer hardships, and they would eat their own babies. And this is recur recorded in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 53 to 57. Mm -hmm. 
And when the country of Aram invaded Israel and surrounded it, they said, let's boil and eat my son today. Dozens of people would eat it. Tomorrow's your son. Okay. Today, you ate my son, and tomorrow, we eat your son, right? And this is reported to the king. So what does the king do? Tears his clothes. And such a curse is recorded in chapter 6 of Second Kings. Dear saints, this is a fact of history. If we don't bear the fruits of the temple, this won't be a country where we feel comfortable day and night. Children will become separated. They won't listen to their parents. They'll commit crimes, go to prison, do drugs. They get married, but after a few years, they divorce again. And if we look in Deuteronomy 28, it's written that although she is my wife, when she gets married, she becomes another man's wife. Anyway, fruitless people are the same. It's not limited to Israel. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How have I tried to bear you under the wings of a hen? How have I tried to bear you under the wings of a hen? You didn't want it. The words of peace and blessing have been hidden from your eyes. And he said that not a single stone will be laid upon another. Did they listen? That they be completely torn down and destroyed horribly? It didn't, they didn't listen. If we look at Matthew chapter 23, verses 37, 39, Luke 13, verses 34 to 35, in Luke 19 to 41 to 44, it's there. Dear saints, at this time, today, the Lord knows that this is your temple, and He has now entered and examining your past, present, and future. And at the time of Jesus, the temple took 47 years to build. For Zerubbabel, the construction began in 19 B.C. and was dedicated eight years later. later. And in 11 B.C., the temple is completed in 64 A.D. However, when they entered the temple, they set it up for the Roman god Zeus. They slaughtered a pig, and then they sprinkled with pig's blood. And they worshiped, They tried to worship the but they would cut off all the branches with a single knife. And we see that people who tried to get circumcised were killed on the spot. They didn't listen when the prophet prophesied. That story, is that true? They didn't even think about They couldn't even imagine it. And was it all about like dancing, playing, eating, drinking, gambling, and all of that? And then the young men grow old and turn gray. They have their own sons and daughters. They have grandchildren. And they say that everything is ruined by the time grandchildren arrived. And a man like King Zedekiah goes to Babylon. And we see that a Babylonian comes and cuts out the king's eyes with an awl. He was bound in chains. And he was he saw his son being beheaded with a knife before they gouged out his eyes. And then isn't this what the prophet Jeremiah prophesied? He said, catch that guy. In today's terms, 
Wouldn't the chief secretary have come and arrest him and put him in prison? This is a fact of history. Everyone, is your temple clean? Is it clean? Jesus entered today. He is entering today. What if, what, so what if I tell you from 2,000 years ago? You already know that. That's on the surface, but today on the inside. So when we think of the most holy place of the heart, it's the conscience. And if your conscience is all seared and paralyzed, and then what good would it be used for? You come to church, you just sit there blankly out of your mind, worry about things like my children, my husband, about money, interest, take a deep breath, and then you go. And so can the Word of God comfort you? It's not possible. I said it mentioned earlier. This is found in Luke chapter 16, 14. At that time, the religious leaders loved money. If we look at 1 Timothy 6, 10, the love of money is the root of all evil. And also in Exodus chapter 30, verse 13, we see that according to the verse, they received money as the price for sin offering, half a shekel. But when they exchanged the money, they added a lot to it, and they ate off of that. So isn't that why Jesus threw all the money of the money changers, flipped it over? They're, when they exchange money, do they just exchange it? And don't they take some, don't they skim some money off? They exchange it for a few pennies. They made a praying church, not into a den of robbers, but uh, not into a den of thieves, but a den of robbers. And these are peoples who not only do bad things, to families, individuals, or kind, but they, these are supposedly believers. It's a den of evildoers. It's a den where there is no God. Isn't a tenth God's? And they would take the tithe. And they didn't know the sin. Where is there such a thief? If we look at Malachi chapter 3, verse 7, God is asking, why did you steal from me? And then, we, and then they ask, oh God, when did we steal? You stole from tithes and offerings. So if we look at Psalm, if we look at Psalm 10, 9, if we look at Psalm 10, 9, And we see where they do wrong. They, it's clearly a den of robbers where they do bad things, where they gather. They abuse something sacred to, for their own profit. And we see this also in Jeremiah chapter 7, 11, and Luke chapter 19, verse 46. People who practice theft, murder, adultery, falsity, idolatry, they think they can be saved by worshiping the temple of Jehovah. It's quite astonishing. At the time of Jesus, even among the residents of Jerusalem, they thought that they could live comfortably and like in a safe zone. But God spoke first through Jeremiah. You have all these arrogance and bad thoughts. 
and do all kinds of bad things. And you, you live this long and you think, oh, this is God's blessing. Where can you find children with such foolish thugs? They take God's holy area and they turn it into an evil zone. And God finds it disgusting. He finds it, it's the pretense, hypocrisy, and formality. And even in Matthew 23, it says, You brood of vipers, you serpents. Oh, Jesus, you're too much. How are we vipers? And he said, because of hypocrisy. You're different from the inside and the outside. And it was said early by the psalmist, And they said, oh, amen, hallelujah, Lord Jesus, give me grace. And he's saying, you, deaf brood of vipers. So we need to stay alert. Try living without losing your mind. It's astonishing. You always hear about the grace of Jesus like this. Oh, I think, oh, church members are truly more blessed than I am. They live in this hectic life of the world. They, they listen to God's word and receive grace. And they come to keep the precepts and be blessed in the name of Jesus for all the generations to come. God, please give them beyond what they want with wisdom, understanding, insight, and knowledge. And who is the mystery of God? Isn't it Jesus? Jesus is the mystery of God. So, when we have this mystery, let us all take it and go back to our homes. If I preach without praying, am, am I just like a hired hand of a pastor? And I'm saying this before God. You cannot, I have never stood up on the pulpit without praying. Shouldn't a shepherd who leads sheep and souls first bow down before God, before standing on the pulpit? So Jesus didn't Jesus come to the temple himself and curse to the fig tree? So at this time, think of how much, how embarrassing it would be if he had come and did this to us directly. However, With the word given today, I believe that we'll become great believers and I praise the name of the Lord. I pray that you will become a fruitful saint. First, I pray that you will bear the fruit of repentance. And I pray that it bears good fruit according to your wishes. I pray in the name of the Lord that you may bear the fruit of prayer, the fruit of evangelism, and the fruit of loving your neighbors as yourself. So for unfavorable conditions, turning into favorable conditions and suffering today, I came to Passion Week. I heard the word, repented in my heart with a fervent focus before God and prayed again and made a vow before God, truly rejoicing God that until I enter the kingdom, that I will be your son, your daughter. And I request in the name of the Lord that you will make such prayers. James chapter 3, verses 17 to 18. Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 through 8. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 6 and 7. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. Philippians 4, 5. Luke 6, 36. Romans 12, 9. As you read the words given to the end, you must realize that the fruit of martyrdom is not 
do not just avoid the prospect of death, but have a joyful heart if it's the Lord's will. And if it's the Lord's will, if it's his, then our body can be burned for the sake of the kingdom and righteousness. And I will go before God correctly by speaking the right words and the righteous words of God. I hope that you become a spiritual saint, a martyr like Pastor Pastor Juki Chol, our senior in faith, who had a joyful heart in his martyrdom. The temple is where God resides. God is in the temple. And when we pray in the temple, God says that he hears and sees everything. First Kings chapter 8, verse 16. 2 Samuel chapter 7 verses 4 through 16. Deuteronomy chapter 12 verse 11. 1 Kings chapter 8 verses 28 to 29 and also verse 52. 1 Kings 9 3 and also 2 Chronicles 7 15. And lastly, Nehemiah 1 6. How precious are these words? It's very precious. After cleansing the temple, the Lord and His beloved disciples, they didn't know what was going on. It's only, it was recorded that only after he died and came back to life that they became to understand Jesus' actions. So even though they had followed him for three years, they did not understand Jesus' actions. And also, we see in John 2, the temple is destroyed. And the Lord said, I will build the temple in three days. This is the temple which took 46 years to build. Then who would believe it? So it took apparently 46 years. It would tear it down and build it up in three days. No one would be able to believe this. So when we look at the Bible in chapter 2 of John, he's talking about his own body, which has become a temple. And these hawk-like religious leaders at the time, they blink, and they didn't know the meaning of Jesus' real thoughts, including disciples. Didn't the Lord die and be resurrected three days later? They forgot all that. The temple is where God resides. Please believe that God is in your heart. I hope you'll always have the attitude of worshiping God with your heart, with your mind and heart. Please believe this is the holy house that proclaims the word of God. There's a UN General Assembly. God, let my heart be like the UN General Assembly. So I ask you to grant me a wide heart, broad heart for anyone to come pray. I hope that you become that kind of saint. God, I ask for us to make this a blessed and holy house where you dwell, informing the descendants that it's God's temple and that it is God's house of prayer. And in your hearts, may God be revealed in the harmony and peace that God is pleased with and that wherever you go in your footsteps, things will be achieved. The word will be fulfilled. And I pray this blessing in the name of the Lord. And now, I hope that the fellowship believers will never be cut off and that the passion of prayer never cools down. We need the zeal of prayer and we must have the passion of evangelism that it will not cool down, that you will always crowd to God and that you will boldly take the lead in missions work 
with all the authority of God in heaven and on earth, and that you will be number one. And I praise blessing upon you, Lord. Let us pray. On the second day of Passion Week, briefly preached about the cursing of the figs and the cleansing of the temple. Living Lord, please cast out all those who only believe in Jesus with their mouths and only with head knowledge. But may we have all of the passion in our hearts and minds and sincerely of being open and having the word be enlightened to us. It's not just a week of suffering, but time to truly follow in the footsteps of the Lord to, and to clearly see and understand every single incident up until the time of the cross to comfort the heart of the Lord to make his heart happy and to understand the heart of the Lord and follow in his footsteps and that we will not turn our backs or betray him and then please grant us a strong Abraham like faith that goes on forever and please grant us faith like the faith of Joseph of Arimathea who is strong, courageous and also please grant us faith just like that of Mary Magdalene who did the amazing work of beautiful faith that will follow us all the way to the grave that followed all to, to Jesus' grave and also please on the third day let us have the firm determination and resolution to give glory to God and also please bless every family member that came out today so that their descendants may be blessed in the name of Jesus I pray for every word to be offered up with this prayer of thanksgiving in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.